Hello, and welcome to the Black Ponder. I'm Neil Trotter. Today, let's talk about political philosophy. Well, let's actually talk about foundational political philosophy. And you really can't get more foundational than Aristotle's The Politics. Now, what this work actually is, is a grouping, a collection of Aristotle's notes, lectures. We don't really know which are lectures and which are notes. There's also essays in here, rough drafts, because a lot of it seems unfinished or unedited. It's a collection of separate texts related to Aristotle's writings about politics. So it's not one cohesive single book, you know, with a beginning, middle, and a conclusion, introduction, body. It's not that sort of thing. It's more of an anthology, a, a collection of works, but they're all related to Aristotle's thought on politics. Would I recommend the politics to somebody who's just getting started in studying philosophy? No, I would not. <laughs> not that it's it's hard to understand. It's not that difficult to understand, thanks a lot to the translators of the book. I think they did a good job with the footnotes and the supplemental text to help understand the areas of incompleteness and what seems to be unedited. But there's not a lot of takeaway philosophy that you can apply today I, I feel when I read this book that's because it's it's pretty old school. it's dated it's pretty old school I mean, Aristotle is talking about things like how best to handle slaves <laughs> right okay that's an obsolete concept I heard there's a part in here where Aristotle is talking about well the best age for two people to start having children to procreate well the, the lady should be age 18 and the male should be age 37 that's that's a good age range <laughs> to begin procreation <laughs> just a lot of outdated ideas and things like that to be quite honest with you it's also heavy on politics right hence the name and it's more i feel political than it is philosophical i would recommend the politics to somebody who's really into political history and you're you know at the part where you're trying to understand the history of politics this is a great place to start because Aristotle's in an era where democracy is just getting started right and is still being contested whether democracy is the best form of government there's all these different kinds of government that are still considered just as legitimate like aristocracies or even tyrannies Aristotle talks a lot about this form of government called oligarchies which are basically a few separate groups that are really powerful, kind of buying for power and controlling the masses in their own individual ways. So if you're trying to get some background on early politics, this is a great book to start. This is also a good book to start also if you're just into political philosophy, right? Because that's a whole branch on its own. And this is some fundamentals. Granted, there's some dated ideas in here, but you get to see the foundation. You get to see where we've come from. We started here and now we're at this level. Of course, we're not perfect, but I think we've matured past this era. I would also recommend this book for diehard Aristotle fans, right? If you're trying to get in the thought process of Aristotle, if you wanna know how the man thinks, uh, The Politics is a good book to check out because in, in The Politics, you know, these are rough drafts, these are notes. So you get to see Aristotle talk about a point and formulate an idea and then all of a sudden he'll shift to another idea out of nowhere and then he'll weave it back into what he was talking about before. And then sometimes he'll talk about other things and completely abandon them and just go somewhere else. It's interesting. So if you want to really understand Aristotle in his mind, how he worked, how he formulated concepts and ideas, it's a good book to check out. In my opinion, uh, the politics doesn't really have that much takeaway philosophy that you can use and apply it today. Um, it does have some, I think, and it does have some really valuable gems in there that you, we can use to apply it to our lives in the modern world. Because really that's what the Black Ponder of this channel is about, is about practical philosophy for the modern age. And that's what I do on this channel. I talk about quotes that kind of jumped at me and kind of spoke to me not necessarily the most important parts of the book per se a lot of them I feel are but you might not agree you might think like all these aren't really that important to the actual book itself 
but they kind of spoke to me. Well, I try very hard to do. I don't take quotes out of context, right? I do feel that when I talk about a quote, the idea behind the quote underlines the entire theme of the book. Those, those type of quotes I like. So let's get to it. Let me, let me share with you the first quote. As soon as a man becomes entitled to participate in office, deliberate or judicial, we deem him to be a citizen of that state. And a number of such persons large enough to secure a self-sufficient life, we may by and large call a state. So here Aristotle is talking about what it means to be a citizen, the definition of a citizen. So a citizen in Aristotle's view is someone who is entitled to participate in office, deliberate or judicial. Basically somebody who is able to participate in government affairs, politics, right? So in this era, does that include slaves? No, so slaves aren't citizens. Does that include women? No, because back in, the, back in those days, women were allowed to participate in politics. But setting all that aside, let's not focus on that. I mean, that, it, that's an important thing. And it just shows how dated the era is that Aristotle is talking about. But let's talk about the idea behind it. Because I think this is important. Nowadays, citizenship is about, well, you're born into in the country, therefore you're a citizen. Which is, you know, that's a qualifier. You know, I'm specifically talking about what country I live in, America. But... And the other countries, a lot of other countries is like that too. But Aristotle makes it a point and says, look, it's about participating in government, in politics. That's really where the true meaning of a citizen lies. And I would go further, me personally, not Aristotle, because Aristotle uses the word entitled. So let's uh, be clear about that. Me, what I'm saying is to be a, a meaningful citizen, you got to be participating in the political process. It isn't enough to say, well, I was born here, so therefore I'm a citizen. Yeah, that's true. That does qualify you as a citizen. But if you want to be a true citizen, a meaningful citizen, what's important is that you partake in the political process of the state that you're a citizen of. If you're not doing that, then you're not really falling in line with the definition of what a citizen is. What I'm getting at is there's a lot of people I know, and there's a common notion. Things, for example, the people who say, oh, you know, voting is a complete waste of time. If you feel that way, hey, I mean, you know, there's some merit in that <laughs> uh, idea. I will admit that. But at the same time, you can't just be like, yeah, I'm just not going to vote because I just feel that it's meaningless. And then you just kind of give up and you just never involve yourself in politics. There's people who's like, do not talk to me about politics. I don't want to hear about that. Let's just talk about something else or government or anything like that. You got to be involved in some way with the political aspect of the, the state that you're in. And what makes you a citizen is your participation in the political process. If you're not doing that, then you're a citizen, but I would argue you're not, you're not a meaningful citizen. Maybe that doesn't mean voting. Maybe that means taking the steps to make voting actually meaningful. <laughs> you know, step it up to the plate be like, okay, why doesn't it mean so little to vote? And what should we do to make voting a more meaningful action? and actually doing something to make that happen. That's what it means to be a citizen. I don't know, that's what I got from that quote. Let's hear, let's listen to another quote. But when the same population continues to dwell in the same territory, must we say that the state remains the same as long as there is con continuity of race among that population? Even though one generation of people dies and another is born, just as a river or spring is commonly said to be the same, although different water passes into and out of it all the time. Alternatively, ought we speak of the population as being the same for the reasons stated, but say that the state is different? For the state is a kind of association, an association of citizens in a constitution. So when the constitution changes and becomes different in kind, the state also would seem necessarily not to be the same. Let's repeat that last part. For the state is a kind of association, an association of citizens in a constitution. What is a state? Is it a collection of people living in an area? That's not just what a state is. <laughs> That's just what I said. It's just a group of people, no matter how big, just living in an area. Uh, a state is the association between 
citizens in its constitution. Now that's my word. So right, Aristotle said, doesn't use the word between. Let's get it, don't, let's not get it twisted. Aristotle says, an association of citizens in a constitution. So he's talking more about the association between various citizens. But I don't know, I would take that a step further. And I, I what I got out of it was that it's about the association between the citizen and the constitution. Again, the citizen has to, in some way, participate or interact with the actual constitution of the state and that interaction that's what a state is it's not an area it's the interaction between the constitution and the citizen now what does that mean of course all citizens in some way are interacting with the constitution right because we all have to follow laws and if we don't follow laws we get in trouble and things like that so in that way everybody interacts with the constitution in some way but i would say to be a true citizen you have to be a, an active participant in that interaction you could be a passive citizen, one who doesn't really know what the Constitution is. There's a lot of Americans who don't, in fact, most Americans don't really know the Constitution of the United States, right? They know, like, we the people, la 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 la, right? You know, that old school document with all those signatures at the bottom that has all that really fancy cursive writing. Most Americans don't really know what's actually written in that document. And to be quite honest, most citizens of most states don't really know what's being said in the constitutions of their states. What am I saying here? I'm not saying that you should memorize the constitution of the United States. I'm not saying that. But I think to be a true citizen, to be a meaningful citizen, you have to know to a decent extent what actually is in that document, right? Maybe at least read it in its entirety, like once in your life. <laughs> I mean, it is the document that your entire state is operates under. And it's important to understand the meaning behind that document. So if political leaders, government officials do things that are outside what that document says, you can call them out on it as a citizen, right? And also, there's the other thing. If you read the document and there's something you disagree with as a citizen, you have the right to ask that document to be changed. In America, we call that an amendment in addition to the U.S. Constitution. In that way, a state is not static. A state is constantly changing because its citizens are interacting with the Constitution and the Constitution is changing, hopefully for the better. Let me share with you an example that's kind of modern today. You know, in America right now, we're going through this whole controversy about police militarization. There's even a Twitter keyword for it now, whatever you call those things. Hashtag Black Lives Matter. There's this big thing now where, where citizens are starting to protest about the treatment police officials are doing to primarily African Americans. Now, by any means, this isn't anything new. Mistreatment from police officers to minorities, specifically African Americans, that's been going on for decades, right? It's just now everybody has a camera now, a smartphone, and you know smartphones now can, within them they can have little cameras that shoot high definition video. So it's now people are catching it. You know people are starting to catch it now. Now we can share it on all these social media websites, and people outside the minority are beginning to see what's going on. I come from an area. Let me tell you where I'm from. I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm actually from the city of Oakland. It's on the map. <laughs> Oakland is um metropolitan city and Oakland is notorious let's be honest here it's got this infamy this this bad reputation for protests that kind of turn into riots <laughs> now a lot of that is blown way out of proportion to be honest with you most protests that happen in Oakland Oakland is a very political uh, city there's a lot of protests that go on in Oakland but most of those protests are very peaceful right but there is a little bit of truth in that I will admit that we do sometimes on occasion some of these protests really do go out into riots and that's a shame but more often than not these riots happen from people who are, don't even live in oakland they're outside oakland and they start some trouble and all of a sudden it becomes something that it wasn't i bring that up because i I, you know, I see this a lot and i'm seeing people get you know they're getting angry they're protesting they're out there on the street they're letting people know like this is something we don't want it 
The police need to respect the rights of the citizen. They're out there on the street and they're protesting and that's good because that builds awareness. But there's a, a step that's missing, I feel. And that step is the interaction between the Constitution and the citizen. Let's look back at the Civil Rights Act that happened in the 60s. Well, a lot of those civil rights activists, not only did they protest, they also approached politicians and, you know, got, went up all the way to the President of the United States, but also to state senators and House representatives. These are the political leaders of, like, the American government system, if you're, you know, from another country. A lot of these civil rights activists, they sat down, they wrote up new laws, right, and they approached their government officials and proposed them as changes to the Constitution, right? Bills is what we call them in America. And that's ultimately how change happened in this country, how like the whole Jim Crow laws was eventually phased out of mainstream implementation. It was through political action. Right now we're seeing this whole antagonistic relationship going on with the protesters and the politicians. Protesters are out there they're like, yeah, this is happening, this is bad. F the police, F the politicians, they don't care about us. But to make real change happen, you got to channel that frustration into a meaningful interaction between Constitution and citizens. You got to sit down. You got to look at the Constitution, the laws that are written down, see what the problem is, sit down and write new laws together, go up to your government officials and be like, hey, these are the laws that we want. This is what we want changed. As my representative, you need to go to the Congress and propose this as a bill. In America, any citizen can do that. They can write up a law and bring it up to their government representative, and that government representative can work with that citizen and bring it up to Congress to have that law implemented. Let me read you another quote. The state is not an association of people dwelling in the same place established to prevent its members from committing injustice against each other and to promote transactions Certainly all these functions must be present if there is to be a state, but even the presence of every one of them does not make a state ipso facto. Ipso facto meaning by that very act. The state is an association intended to enable its members in their households and the kinships to live well. Its purpose is a perfect and self-sufficient life. Okay? A lot of what the politics is, is a definition of things. Because this is early political philosophy, right? So a lot of stuff is undefined. So Aristotle's trying to define a lot of this stuff so he could talk about it critically. And he's saying what a state is, a state is an association intended to allow its citizens to live well, to have its citizens live perfect and self-sufficient lives. And if that's not what a state is doing, right, then it's no longer a state, it's something else. That kind of reminds me of the whole Occupy movement that happened a few years ago. America was in a situation, well it still is in a situation, and honestly it always has been in a situation where uh, that was true for some people, but it wasn't true for the majority of people. The state isn't associated with its citizens to have them live well and self-sufficient lives, right? That's what a state is. And this whole police militarization protesting that's going on ultimately we're seeing the same thing it's like hey you know the state is has this association with some of its citizens a large amount of its citizens where they're not able to live well you know they're not able to live self-sufficiently all i'm saying is that the protests are great they're good they're bringing out good awareness more and more people are starting to understand what's really going on but for true meaning to happen what we have to do on top of that is we got to look at our constitution and the law, the written down laws, see exactly what's written down that prevents certain citizens from not living well. Look at areas where we can add certain things to enable citizens that aren't able to live well to live well, uh, interact with politics and government officials and hold them accountable. Put pressure on them, make it ha happen. But we gotta step up. We can't have this antagonistic relationship with our government. 
this, you know, F the government, you know, that's not going to make any change. We got to work with them. We might not like them, but we got to work with them because that's what a state is. A state is an association between its citizens and its constitution. And a citizen is one who participates in the development and in implementation of the constitution. That's what a citizen is. At least that's what a meaningful citizen is. So I ask you, are you a meaningful citizen? Are you an active citizen? Or are you a, just a passive citizen? Just keep all that in mind as you look at the news or maybe even participate in a protest about this whole controversy of the police militarization or also just this whole social economic class warfare that's going in, whether it's the Occupy movement or other types of protests. This is what's going down in the politics. I thought it was a cool read. I would say check it out if you, you know, like on an intermediate level of philosophy. It's not hard to understand, but it is very heavy in politics and it's, it's old school. You know, this is BC era stuff. But it's great to see the, some fundamental definitions and there are a few things you can take away that apply to the modern era. Well, this is the Black Ponder. I'm Neil Trotter. Thanks for watching. Tune in next time for more Philosophical Thought.